Hello everyone, thank you for joining my talk. Uh, my name is Johan, I'm a software engineer at Stripe, and today I want to talk to you about my team's ongoing project to migrate our existing time series aggregation system to run on Apache Pinot. I'll tell you a bit about real-time analytics at Stripe, uh, how we're motivating this migration to Pinot, some of the changes we've made to Pinot along the way, how we perform the migration, uh, where we are today, and some of the interesting learnings at the end of it. Real-time analytics at Stripe is in a lot of areas, and some of the places our team powers are when you log in as a merchant, your dashboard charts will be powered by our system. Uh, the charge path, which is the payments that you see go through, as well as other financial products like issuing, payouts, they take advantage of real-time analytics. And one thing that these all have in common are these stringent SLCs our team maintains. So this is a P99 query latency of 70 milliseconds, P99 ingestion lag of 30 seconds, and four nines of availability. So th these are quite strong SLCs. So what motivated the migration to Pinot when we're actually meeting a lot of these SLCs? Well, first I should tell you about the system we have today. It's a Lambda system similar to Pinot called Decibel. Our real-time data comes from Kafka, it's aggregated into Mongo, and our offline data is generated with scalding jobs and stored in a key value store known as Sequence. So users will write decibel jobs, which is a fairly procedural task. You define filters on your events, an aggregation function to combine your events, as well as keys that you will dynamically use to query the data. And users will provide those keys, a time range. Our system will look them up, aggregate the results, and send them back to the user. This is 100% Scala code. We get a lot of compile time safety. And, and in general, it works really well. But where it doesn't is in this real-time ingestion flow. We consume the events from Kafka, we repartition by key, and we aggregate them, republish to the Kafka, consume again, aggregate, and publish to Mongo. All this to lower some of the write load on Mongo. Um, and at first glance, it works really well. We're able to consume a couple hundred thousand events per second and maintain that 30 seconds of lag. But it's these hops that become the problem. Now, if there's a consumer group rebalance or some of these hosts restart, we actually don't safely commit the offsets where we will duplicate, consume some of the data, we will duplicate, publish some of the data. And since that second hop is actually pre-aggregated, there's a linear increase in the number of latent duplicates within the system. And in the past few years, this has actually caused multiple severe incidents due to the fact that our system is returning over-aggregated results. So you may have come across this diagram of Pino telling you how replica groups can help with query performance and availability by effectively putting distinct sets of segments on a server or a group of servers. But what's interesting is these matching numbers are separate consuming streams where each Pinot server is consuming that topic partition on its own and tracking its own offsets. So when one server restarts, the other one can serve the queries for you, and the initial one has time to catch up from that initial starting offset, which means Pinot actually has exactly one suggestion, which is a really important thing for our users. And in our initial experiments, we also found that Pinot can easily support our sub-100 uh, millisecond latency SLCs. That's a very active open source community. Folks are quite engaged. And really important, there's a SQL interface for querying the data, which actually opens up real-time analytics to a lot more of our users than the previous Scala implementation did. So to talk a little bit about how we deployed Pinot at Stripe, we maintain an internal fork. Uh, this is very close to the upstream master. Most of the changes that we've made, we've either upstreamed or they relate to this internal build system where we build Pinot from source, we deploy it to EC2 instances across all components. There are Spark jobs that generate our offline segments, we push them to S3, and the offline servers will download them. And our real-time servers will consume Kafka events from an internal proxy known as kproxy, which I'll actually discuss a little bit later. But we also decided to use the pool-based instance assignment strategy everywhere. We start with a default of three pools, two instances per pool. And what this does for us is actually we can perform very fast rolling restarts and we can easily scale up by adding more pools or more instances if we don't meet our latency or availability SLCs. So let's talk about some of these major changes we made in Pinot. I mentioned kproxy before, and if you've seen my colleague Donnie's highly available Kafka talk, you might be familiar with this diagram, but at Stripe, producers and consumers will go through kproxy when communicating with Kafka. And this allows us to abstract the fact that a single topic or multiple topics will actually exist in multiple Kafka clusters. And what this does is, if Kafka cluster 1 in this case becomes unavailable, the producers and consumers are unaffected. They continue to consume and produce from the remaining clusters. But 
We know in Pinot this isn't quite a supported ingestion strategy. You can't consume from multiple topics in one table, you can't consume from multiple Kafka clusters, but you can build your own stream ingestion plugin. And I've linked uh, the documentation for that, but the main point we want to look at is the one where we refer to a partition as a number not exceeding 32 bits long. So this is where we had to employ a clever solution or a hack, depending on how you think about it, but we mapped all of our Kafka clusters to a stable integer in code. And we encoded that as the first 16 bits. We took the second 16 bits as the partition number. And from there, a bidirectional function gives us the ability to go from a topic partition and cluster to a Pinot partition ID and back. And this has worked really well for us. And for others, it could work where you actually replace the cluster with a topic, so you could consume from multiple topics. But you do lose a good amount of visibility as the Pinot partition ID won't clearly match what it's actually consuming in the logs. The second feature that we open source was the ability to specify aggregations at ingestion time. This is very similar to the star tree index, but in real time, uh, each event as it comes in is actually aggregated by dimension, depending on your configuration. So it's very similar to star tree index again, but you don't get that huge CPU increase when the segment is ceiling. And if you look at the configuration we provided below, what we're saying is we want a column called sum amount that is the sum of the amount field, and a column called count that is the count, which is the number of rows that are emitted in per, per event. And for us, this was really important for data locality issues, uh, performance, as well as lowering our storage costs. So in, in the pros, you'll see that on average, our data was compressed by 100x. So what this meant was by going from millisecond granularity data to 15 minute or hourly or daily data, we saved a lot on storage. And the really important part here is that your data now scales with the dimension cardinality not just your more frequent ID or key. So if you have that one user that has two orders of magnitude more data than any other user, that's okay, because their data will actually be aggregated to the same dimension cardinality as every other user. The other part is with fewer uh, rows, we actually got much better performance to the point that we no longer needed to partition the data in real time. Uh, it was just a whole stream of work that we didn't need to do anymore. Um, and some of the drawbacks, obviously, is you have to know your data and your query patterns ahead of time. It's likely that the aggregations you specify at ingestion time are the ones that you'll specify at query time. So if you need new aggregations or query patterns, you'll likely need a new table. Finally, I want to talk about some of the reliability improvements. At Stripe, we have a requirement that every 7 to 30 days, we must replace all hosts. And initially, we would see issues with uh, latency as well as availability when hosts were restarted or removed from a cluster. But a lot of changes have happened uh, in the uh, open source repository that have actually made these go away. We've improved how brokers and servers join and leave clusters, how they restart, and even we minimize data movement now when rebalancing, which has made it possible for us to replace these hosts every 7 to 30 days with no impact on SLCs. We've made some similar improvements on the Stripe side that we've upstreamed. Uh, my favorite one here is the freshness-based consumption checker. So our real-time servers, when they restart, will wait until events are caught up within 20 seconds of the system time, meaning that by the time the server is healthy and serving queries, we're actually already meeting our SLC. So for performing the actual migration, we, we had to make a few changes to our existing query layer. This diagram is a very simplified version of the architecture, but as a user request comes in, it eventually lands on our proxy layer. We'll query the existing system, in this case, Mongo and Sequence. We'll combine the results, and we'll return those responses to the users. And what we added here was a feature controlled by a flag that after the user's response is returned, we launch a background thread where Pinot is queried. We publish those comparisons to Kafka. And in those comparisons, we have the results from both systems, we have the latency, we have whether offline or real-time data was used, and from here we can build robust dashboards. We can see accuracy, latency, availability, and more for each table. And we can control this feature at each table so that when we're satisfied with the metrics, we can actually flip it, where the primary response comes from Pinot, and then we actually still do the secondary read on the existing system, publish the results, and make sure that any issues that might arise later are still caught in dashboards. And finally, when the migration is complete, we can start by deleting this query path. So the old system is no longer reachable. 
we can then delete any configurations and infrastructure that we no longer need. What's left here is actually the accuracy. When comparing two real-time systems, this is actually quite challenging. But starting with offline data where it's a little simpler, we asserted that we would have 100% accuracy for all offline-only queries to hybrid tables. And because we know when both systems are only using offline data, we are able to specify that very easily. And this is data that's been pre-generated with Spark or Scalding. Now, for tables that are offline only, we actually have to replay the queries with a common upper time bound for both systems, mostly because it's possible that one system has newer data or is refreshed faster, but we still expect 100% accuracy in this case, as both offline data sources should be identical. Where it gets even more challenging is with the real-time results. When you have two systems consuming over 100,000 events per second at different ingestion rates, it's really hard to say, were they accurate? Were they identical? Because there might be milliseconds between events being ingested. So this is where we made some concessions. We started out with a very simple baseline, our results within 1% of each other in these systems. And this is just to tell us, are we even in the right ballpark? Are these systems returning even similar results? From there, we did things like filtering out uh, comparisons where one system is lagging more than 30 seconds. So if one system is very far behind, we know it's not going to be identical. But really, the metric that did it for us is asserting that real-time queries converge to identical results in a small amount of time. And it helps look at a visualization here of what that means. Imagine you have a query coming in where you're filtering by a certain field, let's say key equals ID123. You'll see that on the bottom row, there's a few results that aren't identical, then there is one identical, more that aren't, some that are, and so on. This pattern repeats. But between identical results, we can take a delta t, and then we can plot the distribution of this delta t. We can say, what is the p99 time between two identical results, or the max time between two identical results? And what we found in practice was that for most of our table, this was sub-second, if not low seconds, meaning that even though there were many queries that weren't exactly identical in the real-time path, they eventually became identical. So the systems at some point did have the same real-time data. Now, this wasn't the case for all tables. As I said before, the previous system has a good number of latent duplicates. So there are times when the results just didn't converge. And this is where we did manual debugging. We replayed old queries. We checked against a third data source. Um, but we tried to avoid this for the most part, because with 100 plus tables, 100 plus queries, it actually becomes very difficult to rewrite these all the time to check every single one. Now, some of my favorite slides, uh, where we are today. We've got some numbers. For this migration, we have five clusters, 900 EC2 instances, 300,000 segments, 150 tables, and 30 terabytes of data. All this to say it's a very large scale cluster. Our table sizes range anywhere from 100 megabytes to 7 terabytes, usually depending on how big the data source is, are we filtering events at ingestion time, but there's quite a bit of skew here. And we keep all time retention for offline data and we keep 10-day retention for real-time data. So there's, there's quite a bit of data in the system. But even with that, we're ingesting at the moment 150,000 events per second. We have 20,000 QPS and growing on these Pinot clusters. We're maintaining our four nines of availability. And most importantly is our latency. Our P50 is four milliseconds, our P95 is seven milliseconds, P99 21 milliseconds, and even the P999 is 63 milliseconds, which is, definitely meeting our SLCs and even beating the existing system in a lot of cases, uh, which was not always expected, honestly. But some of the things we learned along the way, there's a lot of great Pinot documentation on how to operate Pinot. So these are just some extra ones I wanted to add. First, we always tracked our availability, freshness, and latency SLCs. These were always the biggest goals. But what this meant was when things weren't working well, we made improvements. We added ingestion aggregation. We moved to pool-based assignment. And when they were working well, we didn't do other work. We didn't add star tree indices to the offline tables. We didn't repartition the real-time data because we were actually doing fine. Another metric that was inspired by a star tree blog is watching QPS per core on the brokers and servers, as well as events ingested per core. So these are usually a proxy to CPU usage or GC time on a machine, but they're much more stable because the machines are usually the same size throughout the day, and your query patterns will follow a certain pattern throughout the week. And in this case, you can see in the top chart, 
we actually, our biggest cluster will have 50 QPS per core at low times and 150 QPS per core at high times. But it's a good pattern, and this lets us set, set an alert threshold at 200 QPS per core. We will actually alert, because this is where we now know that we see degraded latency. But in the events ingested per core, the bottom chart, this is even more variable. You can see we have as few as 1,000 events per core or 5,000 events per core. And really, we, we don't have an alert threshold here. We are just watching it and trying to understand where we can get proxies for degraded SLCs. Um, a couple more charts. So the largest segment size. We know internally that Pinot can support segments as large as 8 to 10 gigabytes. So there's some tables that way. But in this migration, we actually capped ourselves to 1 gigabyte segments. And this was partially because some indices will fail to be created at the 2 gigabyte size, and partially because it's harder to scale a table with very, very large segments without just copying all the data. You can't just spread them out further. Um, and this is where smaller segments actually helps a lot. And the final one is actual ingestion lag. So Pino will give you a lag metric at query time based on the oldest event. But for some of our topics, there's not many events. They are in far out regions where there's just not as many events per second. And that's just not an accurate measure. So we multiplied the ingestion lag metric from our own plugin with the Pino QPS, where zero means no QPS, one means any QPS, to come up with this chart where we get a good idea that ingestion lag is anywhere from one to 10 seconds throughout the day, but there's still spikes that we don't quite understand. They, they usually do not last long. They're related to the servers we're starting. And from our accuracy metrics, it seems that it's more of an artifact of the way our metric system is handling this. But this is a very important one for folks that care about ingestion lag to follow. And then some other just general learnings. Make changes to the open source code. Uh, Pino is easy to run locally. Features are generally well abstracted. And changes can be made and tested in isolation. It's, it's a very approachable code base for how large it is. Talk to others in the open source community. The Slack channel is wonderful. Others will likely have run into the same issues or have ideas. Uh, we recommend investing early in data ingestion infrastructure. This is probably something that's unique to a lot of users of Pino. So integrating it some way in your company that users understand is actually really important, especially if you're not using uh, one of the known ingestion methods that Pino supports. And finally, control planes are really necessary in production. If you want to coordinate things like rolling restarts or do change management on the creation of schemas and tables, it's much better to have these codified workflows rather than trying to do them manually through the UI or arbitrary scripts. So in conclusion, first, we met all of our latency, availability, and ingestion SLCs. Um, this is really incredible, especially now that 50% of our queries are live on Pinot as of this month. Um, and 20% more are already on Pino as secondary reads. We just need to flip the switch once we're comfortable with the remaining metrics. And internally, we're actually looking to start onboarding new Pino use cases. So rather than these very clear filtered and aggregated use cases, we want to look for users that want every single row of their data, users that want dozens of dimension columns where they could be aggregating many different ways, or ones that want upserts and deduplications, things that uh, have mutable real-time segments. I want to thank my team at Stripe. It's been a good year of hard work. Uh, we've done really well. I want to thank Startree for their advice, a lot of the improvements that they've made to Pino, and really the Pino open source community for being so engaged and providing so many features and updates. Thank you all for watching.